Welcome to the GEMS tutorial. My name is Claudia Pampel. I'm working for the Interreg Central Europe Joint Secretariat. I will guide you through our new monitoring system GEMS. I will show you how to register in the system and to, how to fill in the application form. Let's get started. Welcome to the Mo GEMS monitoring system. This is the login page of our monitoring system. You can log in with your email and password. You can select the language, which in our case is only English. You have access to help functions, the help desk with uh, the GEMS user manual and the recorded tutorials. You can email us for support and you have access to the legal document and you can see in which version of GEMS we are currently working. In order to create a new account, you click here in our in case you have forgotten your password, you can contact the system administrator via the link uh, and send an email. So let's create a new account. And so make sure it's a valid email address so that you can receive then the confirmation email. The uh, password needs to be created according to the minimum criteria that are stated below the password. And you need to accept the terms of service and privacy policy in order to be able to register to the system. Upon registration, you will receive an email in your email box uh, with the confirmation link. Once this is done, you can go to the login. So let's log into the system. No, there's a typo in the email address, uh, in the password. Let's do it again. Here we go. So upon login, you arrive at the dashboard. The dashboard shows you the, the section My Application and the Call List. The, you have a, a top menu bar where you can see is who you're logged in and uh, which role the user is assigned to. So upon registration, you have the applicant user um, role, which is the default role in our system that allows you to create a project application. You can log out from the system, um, select the language in case the program runs in several languages. Our Central Europe runs only in English, so only English is available. And you have um, the support function as explained before. Yeah, so here we can see that this user has created already some project application and you have an overview on all the available calls. And a call that is open is marked with this uh, apply button in blue and you can apply for a project. If you would like to see detailed information on the call, you just select the call. And then you can see the call settings. In order to go back to the dashboard, you click on the dashboard icon on the top. In order to access an application that you have created, you select the application that you would like to open from this overview table and you land directly in the project application. So, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm logged in as an applicant user. Um, I'm at the dashboard. And um, as you can see, I have already created some test projects. And here I have the call list. I will now apply for a project uh, for, under a call, the project application. I will give the project a name. We call it test run project and we create the application form. Now I can see the application form listed on the 
my applications in the dashboard. I can see it's in the draft status and I can see the related call. In order to open it, I select it, click on it, and I'm in the application form part of GEMS. In the, the uh, project overview, I can see the status of my project, whether it's uh, still in draft modus or already submitted. And uh, when it was created, I can see the project ID, which is created automatically by the system and uh, the project acronym. Um, I have the applicant name and uh, project name, priority uh, name, specific objective is something that we will fill in in a moment. I can also see the call under which the project is uh, submitted or is going to be submitted. It's uh, the first call. And um, I also can see how much time is left until the deadline. So uh, on the left side, I have the application for menu that I can collapse and open. And I also have the option to collapse and show all the subsections here. Also in uh, this upper um, information, the so-called breadcrumbs, you can see where you are currently located. So if I click here in the project identification, then I can see that I am uh, in the applications, I in my project uh, test run, and I'm in the section project identification. So the section where I'm working in is uh, highlighted in yellow, and you can also see it here in the left menu. Yeah, what is more is a general information. Um, you will find parts uh, marked with an asterisk in red. Uh, all fields that are marked with an asterisk are mandatory fields. So unless this information is filled in, um, you cannot save information. So let's give it a try. Um, I have already the project ID that was automatically created. I have the project acronym that was filled in upon creation of the application form. And now I look for the obligatory fields, um, the program priority. So I can select it from a drop down menu. We have four priorities. I will submit a project on the priority three. Um, and now also the program priority specific objectives appear. I have one priority specific objective under this priority. If I select, for example, priority two, you can see all five priorities. So now all obligatory fields are filled in and you can see um, the save option appears and I can also discard the changes. Upon successful saving, I get a short notification. We have uh, parts where you will find a small I for information. So these are fields uh, where you have some guidance, additional guidance. If you hover over with the mouse, then you will, the information will appear. So let's give the project a title. Test run for call one. Um, and uh, so as soon as I fill in new information, I have uh, again the option to save the information. In case I switch to another section without saving, I will get a warning asking me whether I want to uh, really want to leave the section without saving. If I say cancel, I can go back and I can save the information. And uh, now I can switch to another section without losing the information. Yeah, 
Then uh, what is uh, more here in the project identification? Um, here we, you find also the information on the project duration. Uh, the project duration is uh, rather important um, to fill in at the beginning because it has an impact on other section of the project application, in particular on the budget, because the budget is filled in per period. And in order to create periods, you need to define the duration of your projects. Um, so I insert 36 months. If I would like to have more or less, I can use these arrows. The default period length is defined on program side, it's six months. So Gems uh, calculates that 36 months divided by six will give us six project periods. Yeah, then you also have the project summary, which is a, a text input field. Let's save the information here. What else do we have in section A? In section A, we have uh, also the project overview tables uh, here. Since we are at the very beginning of the project, this information is not filled in because it fills in upon information stemming from other sections filled in. So I will show you another project that is already pretty much filled in. Just give me a second. So here we have the project that was already um, is more mature with more information. So if you go here into this project overview tables, you will see that they are filled up with information on, on the budget overview. So um, here I can use the option to collapse the left menu to have a better view on the tables. So the overview table A3 gives you an insight on the project budget, uh, the program funding. Interreg Central Europe uses the ERDF as a funding source from EU side. And you see the contribution coming from the project partners. Uh, split into automatic public contribution, public contribution, summed up to public contribution. Then we have private contribution and the total of partner contribution summed up out of public and private contributions. And you also see the total eligible budget for your project. The project output and results overview uh, is information um, stemming from the work packages on where you fill information on the outputs, output title and the targets. And uh, from section C, um, where you fill, provide information on the program result indicators that are um, yeah, connected to the outputs. Um, so you um, can hover over the output indicators and you will get next to the output indicator name, also the, the code. So this is the information that shows up here. The same we have here for the program result indicator. So you have the name of the result indicator and the, the code that is given by the program. Yeah, the baseline for the result indicators um, is always zero. And here is the target value as filled in by you for the result indicators. Same all, uh, um, applies also for the target values. This is it about section A. Uh, maybe also a short information on the project version. So this is a project that was uh, handed back to the lead applicant uh, after submission. So we have a version one and a version two, and you can uh, switch between the versions um, before you submit the project. So you, we go back to our um, uh, pro first project application that we just started to fill in. You will find only one project version because it's still in the draft status, not submitted yet. Yeah. Then uh, 
in a moment we will go to the section B, project partners and continue filling in the application form. So we have filled in section A, the project identification, and we move now to section B, the project partners. So the, let's go to the partners overview. This is where you insert a new project partner. In order to add a project partner, you click on add new partner. Also here we have some fields marked with the red asterisk showing that those fields are mandatory to be filled in before you can save the section. So um, we say it's the lead partner. We give it an abbreviation and uh, then the legal status is also required it's a public institution now we can create the partner and uh, as you can see um, the partner shows up now here in the left menu and uh, also here in the breadcrumbs and um, what uh, also happened is that uh, the subsections of the partner section are open now. So we have identity, address, contact, motivation, the budget, the co-financing and the state in aid information that is filled in per partner and uh, organized in subsections on the project partner. Yeah, so um, when let's have a look like how the partner overview looks like now. So here you will have the partner listed in the as first entry in the overview table. You have the partner number, you have uh, the abbreviation, the partner role. Once we have filled in the address, we will also have the country information here. And uh, the, once the budget is filled in, also the total budget will show up here. Um, if you would like to remove a partner, you can delete it uh, by clicking the trash icon. Uh, you can add new partners here. And what is also very handy is you have a shortcut. So in order to, if you would like, uh, go quickly to the budget section of a partner, you take the shortcut and you are in the budget section. But let's start with the identity. So in uh, this section, you give the core data of the partner. So the name of the organization uh, in the original language and in the English language, in case uh, the department is participating, then you can also um, fill in information on the department. You provide information on the legal and financial information. You select the type of partner from the drop-down menu uh, in case needed also the subtype of partner. You define the legal status as we have seen before. Um, you select a the sector of activity according to the NACE code. It's a drop down menu where you can select the code and uh, detailed information on about the NACE group level is uh, on the Eurostat website, which can be accessed via the link. You uh, fill in the VAT number. So there is a specific format for each country. Um, guidance on how to correctly fill in the VIT code per country is in the GEMS user manual. Um, there's also then guidance in the pre-submission checks. In case you're, the, project has part, the project partner has no VIT number, then you can provide an other identifier number. And if available, please fill in the PIC code from the EC participant register. You save the information um, and uh, as a next step, we fill in the partner address. Here we have the partner country 
that can be filled in. The information is always in the country or original language, so it might be a bit tricky at the beginning to find a, a country. So Croatia, you would search on the HR Privatska, so the country code or check country um, like this, or you go through the scrolling. Yeah, then uh, also for the department, you can fill in the address contact information if applicable. The contact details for the legal representative on the contact person, the motivation of the partner to participate in the project. These are text input fields. Yeah, then uh, let's go back to the partner overview and add a new partner. To see how it looks like with several partners. Local status is private, maybe in this case. And you will see you have the two partners in the partner overview. So we have filled in our first two partners, um, but we have not filled in the budget. So let's take the shortcut to the partner budget by clicking on this icon. We are now in the lead partner budget section and um, so what the first table is the partner budget overview table, which is still empty because no budget was filled in so far. The second part refers to the partner budget options. For detailed information, please refer to the program manual. So you have uh, the staff cost flat rate that can be selected, it's a 20% uh, of the direct cost, it's a fixed rate, so you cannot uh, have more or less than 20%. Then we have the office and administration flat rate, which is uh, uh, an obligatory flat rate uh, for the office and administration cost category. It's always 15%, uh, also not changeable. And we have the travel and accommodation flat rate, um, which is depending on the country the partner is coming from. So here you can adjust it to the uh, appropriate percentage. Information on the percentage you can find in the program manual. In case uh, the partner uses the other cost flat rate, uh, it's 40% on the staff costs. It's also a fixed rate that cannot be changed. Then the other flat rate options cannot be selected. We will take for our example um, office and administration flat rate and travel accommodation flat rate uh, with 5%. We save the information and now uh, we can start filling in the partner budget. Maybe one uh, Hint, um, in order to properly fill in the partner budget, uh, make sure that you have defined in section A project identification, um, the project duration, because it gives you the number of periods and you will see we need the periods when we fill in the budget. So staff costs, in order to add uh, items to this cost category, I click on the add. The table is not fully visible because I only see until period four. So I can either scroll in order to see the other periods or I collapse the left menu and I have a bigger view on the budget tables. Yeah, so we have also here uh, 
the entry field for the total cost, staff cost. So let's say we have 60,000 staff cost in total um, from the entry field, it's transferred to the total column. And now we split the amount to the periods. And uh, we already see that we have um, a warning here that the amount per periods must match the total. We can also see it here that there's still a gap. So we have the amount allocated to the period is not yet the, fully the 60,000. So we are still missing 20,000, which I will now allocate to the period five. Uh, now it matches. If I enter now another 10,000 to period six, I uh, get again uh, an information that uh, the amounts are not matching and there is a surplus of 10,000 euros. So either I increase the total 70,000 and make it match or I uh, adjust it in the period. So here the system supports you in get having the figures right. Um, the budget can be also entered from starting from the period. So you could start entering the budget in the periods. Uh, it sums up in the gap and then you see the total amount. So it's 30,000 and I insert the total and the amounts match again. In case I, I uh, made a mistake and I would uh, like to remove the entry, I can use the trash bin. Office and administration, uh, since we have selected the flat rate option is automatically calculated. The same applies for travel and accommodation. It's selected here in the budget options. So it's automatically calculated for external expertise and services cost category. I also uh, add cost items by clicking on the add button. Um, it's for example, a study. So uh, in staff cost, I only have the, the entry fields for the budget amounts in external expertise and service. I also have a description of uh, on the cost item. And uh, in equipment, uh, it's quite similar to external expertise and services. Uh, and in addition to the description field, I have here a drop down menu for the investments. So, based on the, uh, in case your project has investments and they were defined in section C4 work plan, then the, the code of the investment will show up here. I will show it to you in a more advanced project. Give me a second. Um, I think it was this partner who had an item. Yes, so here, for example, if we have uh, on the equipment, we can then select the uh, respective investment. The same applies then for infrastructure and works. Also here, we can select the investment that was defined in the work plan under a work package. We go back to our project. So um, budget can be filled in them for, for uh, cost category equipment and also for infrastructure and works. So once you have filled in this information, you can double check, now we have to save. And now the amounts also show up here in the partner budget overview. Uh, so you have the budget of the partner splits to the cost categories. In case um, the flat rate option other cost is selected, then the 
um, it will show up under this column, other costs, and uh, the lump sum, um, in case the partner uses a lump sum for the preparation and contracting costs, uh, it will be transferred uh, into this column. You can also see the lump sums allocated to the partner at the very end of the partner budget section. Here's a table showing you how much was entered uh, for partner for the lead partner in section E1, which is referring to the project lump sums. Um, so for this partner, nothing has been entered so far. So nothing shows up here. If you go to the more advanced project application and have a look at the partner budget table here, you can see this partner, for example, he uses the uh, cost category other uh, cost, um, sorry, the, the flat rate other cost, uh, um, which is 30% of the staff costs. You, so you only have the staff costs here and uh, you have uh, the flat rate amount listed here in this column and in section E1, the partner uh, got 7,500 uh, of preparation costs. So they show up here and they show up also here in this section. Let's go back. So this is the partner budget. So just as a reminder, the partner budget is under the single partner. In order to access the partner budget, um, you either go to the partner and then to the budget section, or you take the shortcut from the partner overview table and clicking on the shortcut icon and you are back into the budget section. So we have filled in the budget for the partners. Uh, let's go now to the partner co-financing. So based on the budget that was filled in in section budget, uh, the table uh, B18 co-financing is uh, automatically pre-filled. So we can see the partner budget displayed here. And we can see that we have mandatory fields to be filled in in order to be able to save the information. Uh, so as a first step, uh, we select the co-financing source, which is ERTF in case of the Interreg Central Europe program. Um, it's 80% uh, uh, co-financing automatically filled in by the system once you select ERDF. Uh, and we can see the remaining 20% of partner contribution. So these 20% uh, partner contribution uh, need to be further specified in the following table, the origin of partner contribution. Since we are filling in the uh, partner contribution for partner NGO, um, the partner is automatically displayed here. We um, select this legal status, um, as it was defined in section partner section identity. So the, the institution uh, legal status. And um, we can say um, the full amount of uh, the partner contribution comes from the partner institution itself. And once this information is filled in, maybe I show it again. Um, so here we have uh, information in red that um, the difference is uh, 20,160, which is the partner contribution amount. So if I fill it in here, then, okay, I have, <laughs> now it matches. Now it matches and uh, the red line uh, disappears. It could be the case that um, the organization gets also some um, co-financing 
um, from a national fund. Uh, so this can be specified by adding a new um, source of contribution. Here it's the legal status of the fund. Since it's a national fund, we say it's a public fund and uh, maybe 10,000 of the partner contribution comes from the fund. And then we have to reduce the partner's own contribution and uh, the amounts will sum up again to the 20% of partner contribution and I can save the information. So while for the partner institution, we have the possibility to select between public and private because it refers to the partner, to the partner organization, for the funds, we have three options, public, private, and automatic public. For details, uh, please refer to the program manual. Yeah, the last table then uh, shows the share between public and private uh, contribution. Also here, it sums up to the 20% of partner contribution that we have seen here. So it's just a viewing of the details. In case the partner budget is increased or decreased at the later moment, so maybe we add some external expertise and service. So we have a pool of uh, 3,000 euros uh, in period three, edit. We save the changes. You can see that the partner budget changed for this partner. And uh, this is why we get an error message now in the co-financing because the partner budget has increased. So also the uh, amount of the partner contribution needs to be uh, adjusted. And it's done here in this uh, second table and you would update so that it matches again the 20,760 euros. Yeah, this is it about the co-financing. So we are still in section B. Um, we, go, we are in the partner overview and uh, we would like to fill in the information on state aid per partner. So I select a partner from the... Um, partner overview table and go to section state aid. Here, uh, I have to provide information on state aid. Um, we have two sets of questions to be answered in case the answer is uh, selected yes, then uh, justification should be provided. And uh, I'll fill in the information here. Um, you can select state aid relevant activities um, from, uh, how, um, from a drop down menu that uh, is based on C4 entries. So, in this project, we have not filled in section C at all. So, we cannot see it here. But I have a more mature project uh, that I will show you. And here we can see how it looks like if this is filled in. So we can also go to the lead partner state aid. And if I now go to this section, I can select uh, activities from the work package. And in case in, work pack, in the work package section, um, activity 2.1 is uh, removed, then it automatically is removed in this section. Yes, then uh, we have uh, the section uh, or question D. This needs only to be filled in once uh, the project is selected for funding. We have uh, filled in information in section P for the project partners. Uh, and there is also a separate section uh, called B2 associated partners, um, where you fill in information on associated partners. In order to uh, add a new partner, you click here. Um, 
and uh, you need to fill in the mandatory fields first. So we call it uh, and uh, we define to which partner the organization is associated to and now we can create the partner. You fill in the name of the organization in English um, and original language. Uh, you select the country. So Germany um, and the NATS codes. And uh, you also, legal representative is not applicable and information on the contact person. And that's it already for the associated partner. Once the partner is saved, uh, it shows up in the overview table. You can add additional associated partners. And you can see how this table fills up. From this overview table, you can see um, also to which organization the partner is associated to. If you would like to remove a partner, you just delete it from this overview table. So, uh, start filling in section C, the project description. We start with section C1, the project overall objective. The overall objective is automatically transferred um, based on the information that you filled in in section A project identification. So depending on the specific objective selected here, um, it will reappear here in section C1. And then you have a text input field in order to describe the project overall objective. And you can save the information. C2, um, uh, it's about project relevance and context. Uh, it's a text inputs field here. Um, and we also have um, fields where we can add the target groups by clicking on the plus. Um, so you have a drop down menu to select the target group and a field to specify it. You can add several target groups and specify it. And in case you would like to remove, you click on the trash icon. Similar then for the strategies. Also here, you can add the strategy the project is contributing to. Selecting and in case it does not apply, you remove. Um, synergies with other EU projects or other project initiatives. Um, you can define the initiative here and uh, describe the synergies. And also here you have the possibility to add several projects or initi initiatives and delete if you um, were mistaken. You can save the changes and uh, this is section C2. Section, section, section sorry, three, C3 uh, is about the project partnership. So it's a simple text input field and can be saved here. Yeah, we now go to section C4, the project work plan. Um, in order to add a work package, you click on add a work package and you will have your work package listed. You can add several work packages and uh, please be aware that uh, the Interreg Central Europe program in the first calls uh, requirement has a maximum number of five work packages. So even if you are technically allowed to create more, um, you should not have more than five um, work packages. Yeah. 
we fill in, uh, in order to fill in a work package, you select it from the overview table. And you can see that also the work package section has subsections, uh, objectives, investments, activities, and outputs. So the work package number is automatically created um, and the work pack package title is something you can fill in. And uh, then you specify the objectives. It's a text box and the communication objectives and target groups. And you save the information. In case your project has investments, you can specify them uh, in this section also by clicking add investment, uh, you define the title of the investment and a delivery period. And then you have a couple of text boxes where you describe the investment, you define the location of the investment and more text boxes, ownership, and text boxes to be filled in. Yeah, so the location, uh, we also have to, in order to have the location displayed, uh, that's two level, and then it should show up also in the overview table of the investments. Going back to the work package, um, the activities also added in the same manner. So add an activity, give it a title, and we define the start and end period, period of this phase. Uh, Write a description. You can add deliverables. Description and define a delivery period. Please make sure that the delivery period is within the period of the activity. And you can add more deliverables. Earlier. You can add more activities. Later. And also add the deliverable here. And you save. Then it's important that uh, each work package has at least uh, one output. So you have go to the output uh, section and add an output. You provide a title. Um, you select a, a category, a type of output, uh, the, the, sorry, the indicator, program output indicator. This is what you select here. So strategies, action plan or organization cooperating or jointly developed solutions. You quantify it and you say uh, something about the delivery period. So when it will be ready and available and you can provide a description. You can have uh, you need to have at least one output, but you can have several ones. Also here you select the indicator. You quantify it. You find the delivery period and provide the description. So we have uh, done it now for work package one. 
The same can then be done for work package two and work package three. Project results is the section where you uh, define the envisaged results and achievements by your project. So you add on result, you select a result indicator, you will see the result indicator code and the title of the in, uh, result indicator based on the result indicator, the measurement unit will be shown, the baseline should be always zero. And then depending on the targets you have in your project, you uh, adjust the targets and you provide a description. You can add several indicators and also customize the result indicator target and add the description. Once you save the information, uh, this information will show up in the project overview tables. So here in table A4, you will have the an overview on the output indicators and result indicators in your project. Uh, we are now having a look in section C6, uh, the time plan. This is a section uh, where you don't need to fill in anything. It's uh, an overview table uh, on what you have filled in in other sections. So here you can see um, how your project is structured. You can see the work package that you defined, the activities that you defined, and the duration of the work package, the duration of the activities, and um, how many deliverables you have under an activities and the delivery date of the activity. Um, you can also see then the output uh, per um, um, work package. And uh, yeah, this is uh, in the same then for work package two. The result uh, indicators uh, is a section. This is not really applicable for our program because we do not use a delivery date for result indicators. And that's why the result indicators, even if they are listed here with the indicator name, are not showing up here. So you can unfold uh, or hide this uh, result indicators section. You can use this uh, section in order to see whether your outputs are correctly um, allocated to the period. So whether the delivery period is um, set in the correct place and the correct period. And uh, you, in case a deliverable is outside uh, of an activity, you would also see it here. So this is. Um, a tool that you can use in order to um, double check your work plan, whether it's uh, logical and uh, correctly structured and whether the timing of the activities, deliverables and output is correct. In the section C7, um, you can fill in information on project management and communication. So here, uh, most of the fields are simple text input fields. In C7.5, you define the cooperation criteria. So you have tick boxes that you can select. And if you look into the text, you will see that joint development, joint implementation, and joint financing criteria are mandatory. So we select the three of them. And you can enter description text. For those projects that also have joint staffing, please select also joint staffing. Horizontal principles, also here, uh, you have the principles listed and you select the type of contribution and you can enter a description. Save the changes. And we can go to section C8. Here um, we have just text inputs fields. Um, 
nothing difficult here. Application form, project budget overview tables. Uh, we, we start with uh, the project budget overview table D1. Um, D1 provides uh, the budget per fund and it's automatically generated based on the co-financing section of each partner. So uh, maybe to make it better visible, I collapse the menu. Um, so here you see the partners listed, the co-financing rate, uh, and you see the type of contribution. Table D2 is uh, an overview table that provides information on uh, an overview per partner and per cost category. So you all, uh, have the partners and the cost categories. Uh, you, in case uh, a partner has selected the flat rate other costs, then it's displayed in this column and the lump sum for preparation and contracting cost is uh, displayed in this column. Then overview table D3. It provides an overview of the total partner budget divided per period. So we have the partners, we have uh, the preparation uh, period, which is uh, the lump sum for preparation and contracting uh, costs. Then we have the budget per period. Uh, since we do not have a flat rate uh, or not a lump sum for closure costs, uh, this uh, column remains empty for Interreg Central Europe projects. And we have the total amount. We have also uh, an overview table uh, displaying the, the funds per period, uh, the fund, EU fund applicable for Central Europe is ERDF. So you have just the ERDF shown here. Section E is about the project lump sums. So let's have a look how this is to be filled in. So you can add uh, a project lump sum. Um, if this is used by your project, um, since nothing is filled in, you get a warning. Um, you have to select the lump sum. In uh, our case, it's only preparation and contracting costs uh, lump sum that is available. And um, you put it under the period preparation because it refers to the preparation costs. Um, the system allows you to split up the preparation costs to one or several partners. So you can have this uh, lump sum of 17,500 euros uh, taken by one lead partner or you split it to the project partnership. In our project, we have only two partners defined for the moment. So um, we split it between the two for the moment. And uh, once the splitting matches the total sum of the lump sum, then you can save the information. The lump sum is then automatically transferred to other sections of the application form. So if you have uh, to go to the partner budget, you will see the lump sum in the partner budget overview table. And you will also have it here in this lump sum overview table at the end of the partner budget. Yeah, so if you would like to upload uh, documents to your application, you go to the uh, function application annexes. Um, here you can select the partners for who you would like to upload documents. Um, 
So I select the lead partner, I say upload file, I select the document. So all uh, kind of uh, standard document um, documents, so PDF, uh, Word files, Excel, and so on are allowed to upload. You can add a description, save it. This allows to better recognize the document. You can download a file and you can delete a file. Investment documentation files are not uh, needed at the application stage. In case you upload a file twice, let's try it. It, you will get an error message telling you that the file is already uploaded. GEMS provides you a function called pre-submission checks. It's highly recommended to run the pre-submission checks in due time and already during filling in the different sections of the application form. Do not keep the pre-submission checks until the very last moment, since you might run into time issues for keeping the deadline for project application submission. It's also important to note that the pre-submission checks do not replace human control of the application content. And um, you need a successful pre-submission checks in order to be able to submit your application form. So this is why it's highly important to run it from every now and then to see what uh, is still missing and which section uh, might not be correctly filled in. The, um, the submission checks are, uh, you have three categories of pre-submission checks. You have um, error messages um, highlighted in red. You have um, warning messages highlighted in yellow and uh, once a section is run um, correctly so everything correctly filled in nothing missing then you will get a uh, green okay the you can see then for each section the single issues and uh, so, for example, you have not enough partners defined because you have only two partners, while minimum three partners are needed. Um, there's something missing in the partner identity, for example. So, for the partner min, the VIT is not filled in, and um, for partner NGO, the organization name in English is missing and so on and so on. So the uh, pre-submission checks gives you, give you quite detailed information where and what is missing. I will go show you now a project that is uh, already filled in. And here we run the pre-submission checks and we get uh, Okay, so we, here we can see also the warning. So um, a warning is uh, just a notification to carefully check a section or to make uh, you aware of uh, some rules, but it's not blocking submission. So this project is ready um, to be submitted. And if you submit the project, then it's in status submitted. In order to export your application form into a PDF file and uh, to export the partner's budget, you go to the section export. You can select uh, what, uh, whether you would like to export the application form or the budget. We will start with the application form. Um, since we have uh, only yeah, the started application form, we have only one version to be selected. So the project is still not submitted. So it's version 
one and uh, the language is uh, always English because Central Europe program runs in English only. So I select application form and say export. And uh, I have now the application form section A to C available as PDF. And I can save or print it from here. For the partner's budget, um, this is the partner budget as uh, entered in the, the budget section. It is in, exported in a CSV file. And uh, the CSV file can then be um, opened or transferred into an Excel file. Here, please uh, go to the GEMS user manual to see details in case you have issues in converting a CSV file to an Excel file. The project privileges is a feature that allows you to, allows multiple users to collaborate together in the same application form. It's only possible to invite uh, users that are already registered in GEMS. And uh, in order to add um, a collaborator to your project application, you click on plus, you enter the email address of the registered user and make sure that there is no typo. And uh, now you can see that you have three categories of access that you can grant to this additional user. So the basic uh, access right is the view access right. The user can see the application form sections but cannot make any changes. The edit uh, access right uh, grants uh, not only view access but also the possibility to modify, to fill in the sections of the application form and uh, the access right manage um, gives in addition the option to invite users to the project and uh, assign the access rights as we are doing it now here. So um, it is highly recommended, recommended to be very careful when granting access rights to other users um, the safest is the view access in case you edit uh, access, grant edit or manage access. The, make sure that you uh, coordinate among each others and uh, that you do not work in the application form in parallel and in the same section because users working at the same time in the same page uh, it might lead to unexpected loss of data so that uh, information of a user is overwritten or that uh, content is not uh, properly saved. Um, please always make sure that the project is properly reviewed before submission in order to avoid um, that you have overwritten information and information is not inserted as you would have liked it. Yeah, you can save the uh, additional user and uh, in case you would uh, like to remove, you just click on the remove button.